we'll just start introducing uh, the different uh, panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, we're very pleased that we have uh, Miss Kadri, the CEO of Solvay, uh, at our uh, panel discussion. Um, next to Miss uh, Barcenas, who is the, the global uh, VP of uh, Sustainability at AB InBev. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Uh, Miss Slingenberg, who is the Director for International Climate Policy at the European Commission. And um, we needed to have a, a man, and that's uh, Mr. Uh, Yuanu, who is a professor at the London Business School. So welcome, uh, all of you. Uh, Wim, maybe a first question for uh, the panelists. Yes, um, thank you very much for being here. Um, so uh, what we just heard, of, uh, heard from the, the, the poll was uh, 68, so uh, uh, almost 7 out of 10 of the people watching the documentary thought that we're not doing enough. Uh, Professor Ioannou, um, can we have your take on this? Um, I totally agree. We are absolutely not doing enough. I think that even though we have the direction of change, the magnitude and the speed of change are severely insufficient. Whether we talk about uh, climate change, whether we talk about the sustainable development goals. And I think it's time to have a serious discussion about not only setting targets, which is great, but in fact, setting implementation plans, setting transition plans, and avoiding what I would call target complacency. Just, um, you know, uh, enjoying the fact that we set ambitious targets and, and think that that's where our responsibility stops, whereas that's just the beginning of the journey. So that only highlights to me the amount, the huge amount of work that there remains to be done um, to, to, to really increase the magnitude and speed of change. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Kadri, um, you are the CEO of, of Solve, which is a really uh, big, big organization doing a lot of, a lot of things to support sustainability. Um, can we have your take on the 70%? Yeah, I mean, there is a sense of urgency. And as I say this publicly several times, I truly believe that we are the very last uh, generation that has a luxury to make a choice. Um, now we are going and, and fitting with the time where there may be no choice anymore. So yes, I think um, uh, we, me as a man, as a, as, a, as a mother, as a spouse, as a, uh, as, as a leader of uh, a global chemical company, yeah, indeed, uh, we have responsibility and a duty vis-a-vis uh, -vis the future generation, our kids and their kids. Um, and the, the society, uh, the future of our, the generation goes hand in hand with the E, the ESG, with the environment and the planet. And today we are almost using um, uh, almost two planets worth of resources and we have only one. So I think the, the, the sense of urgency is here on climate change, on the impacts on biodiversity. So I'm very glad to and humbled to lead a, a company um, which is 159 years old and yet reinventing itself, right? And we just launched our Solve One Planet, which is our sustainability roadmap. In February, we joined the Paris Agreement. Uh, we are exiting coal between now and 2030. It's a big deal for Solve because we've been using coal for 159 years. We started our venture with coal. Don't know how to do it all across the board, across the world, but we're going to do it. Um, and, and Solve One Planet is, is, is a declaration that we take it seriously. And it's going to be good for the people, the planet, and it's going to be profitable, by the way. It's not in opposition. Um, and, and that's, I think, important. So, yes, sense of urgency. Uh, and maybe we can discuss more later on on, on how we are going to do it. Miss okay. um, uh, Slingenberg, Franz Timmermans said in the documentary, uh, when we asked him what the EU is going to do, he said, well, businesses uh, need to, you know, need to expect a lot of regulations between now and 2030 if uh, we want to achieve the goals. Um, can you a little bit elaborate on that? Because if seven out of ten of the people said, say, say it's not, uh, we're not doing enough, and, and the urgency is there, uh, um, what, what, can, what can you say about what the EU is doing? Thank you very much. Um, well, it's actually a very good coincidence timing-wise, um, because we have been looking, of course, at indeed the need to do more. We keep on seeing that, uh, you know, the science uh, tells us that that's not enough is being done at the global level. 
Um, at the same time, we have been preparing the ground to step up our ambition in Europe. And today, uh, the European Council of the uh, heads of state and government finished. We just heard the Belgian prime minister who made his statement yesterday. But uh, this morning, I'm very happy uh, and pleased that it's me who can announce that they have found an agreement on a, on a more ambitious target for 2030. We used to have a target of minus 40 percent, um, and we will be stepping up to minus 55. So sub substantial uh, increase in, in, in the ambition. And this will be translated also in a review of the current legislation that is in place, but we will need to make sure that, you know, indeed that that framework is also going to be updated to make sure that we uh, translate this additional ambition level into the rules so that companies and, and different parts of society know what will be coming. Um, just to add that uh, we try not to do things only, uh, let's say, top down from Brussels, we also really want to engage uh, all parts of society in that discussion. And that is what we have been doing when we were, for example, preparing our, our um, debate on how to become climate neutral in Europe, because it will require massive changes. And I heard Mrs. Kadri saying, look, uh, we maybe don't always yet know how to do it, but we have done very extensive analysis that uh, shows that it is economically indeed uh, feasible. It will be ensuring prosperity for all um, and it is technologically feasible, but now, and I think that is a little bit the mantra of your documentary, it is indeed about the how and how we can work together to make it happen. So from Brussels, we will try to put in place the, the regulatory framework, but I think what we already see is that uh, in Europe, you see it coming. There is the end goal now of becoming climate neutral, which is a huge challenge, but also a huge opportunity to modernize our economies and our society and uh, we look forward to having this discussion on you know with all parts of society and notably companies of course that are having to go and innovate in this respect uh, on exactly how to do it and how we can support them in that transition all right thank you very much uh, Ms. Barcenas, um you're heading sustainability at abm uh, which is also a huge company um so how is uh, how are you transitioning to more to a more sustainable company Thank you. Thanks for having me today. So at AB InBev, we're the leading global brewer with operations across 50 markets around the world. And the impacts of climate change are very real across our operations, whether you look at our agricultural supply chains, soil health, water stress that we witness around the world. So we see we see the impacts of climate change across our operations and um, we are motivated to help be part of that transition uh, to a lower carbon economy, to lower our carbon footprint across our across our salt, um, supply chain, but also to build that, that climate resilience. And I think what we've seen this year in the first year of a decade of action, um, you know, with the with the pandemic, is that for the first time we're all witnessing um, the the real impact of climate change and what that means for biodiversity loss and what that means for for human health. Uh, we're witnessing this, and I think there is uh, a, a pressing urgency that that everyone recognizes now around the world, including uh, governments, companies, and society alike. And and you know, cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action at this point. So at Abimba, what we're trying to do is um, uh, we set a science-based target, uh, is approved by science-based targets initiative uh, that puts us in line with 1.5 degree pathway to reduce our uh, emissions across our entire value chain by 20. Uh, by 25% by 2025. And um, it, it's an ambitious task, especially if you look at our, uh, our, our big uh, value chain. Um, we're also, in addition to that, uh, we've committed to uh, becoming 100% renewable electricity by 2025. We are over 60% contracted of our global volume of nearly five terawatt hours. So again, um, what we're trying to do, the way that we go about with these ambitions is uh, we're trying to champion new technologies, uh, bring disruption, bring innovation in markets where this is possible, where there is enabling policies that allow, allow us to, to be competitive and to drive forward with these, uh, with these innovations, but also to bring additionality. So if you look at our renewable electricity target, we're really trying to bring that additional renewable capacity so that we can uh, influence and, and transform um, grids everywhere around the world where we operate. Uh, so definitely uh, there is that, that growing urgency and um, I think we all recognize it now uh, a bit more clearly this year. Okay, that's a big, uh, a big ambition. Um, Ms. Kadri, you all also said about, yeah, that, that you have certain, uh, certain ambitions, certain targets. Could you de develop a bit about, uh, about that? 
Well, I mean, before doing that, maybe going back to what Yvonne said, I think, um, again, we, we believe that the change won't happen if it's not profitable. So I believe that whatever we do, it has to be good for the people, the planet, and the pocket. And I think this is, this is possible. That has been, you know, the history of humanity and science, right? So we need to industrialize it. The second thing Yvonne said, which is really resonates with me and with us at Solve, is the innovation is a key enabler. And we need to increase access uh, to companies and startups and small and medium enterprises, right? To, 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 to that powerhouse called innovation using uh, cleaner materials, using cleaner energy, be it electricity, yes, but clean hydrogen as well is important. And, and we need that infrastructure and we cannot do it alone, including tapping into circulat circularity and using waste, right? Because if you, you use the waste, it's not a waste anymore. And, and the third point for me is really the proper financing is, 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 is a priority. And I applaud what's happening with the EU in the green deal and, and, and this rebound is going to be greener, which is great. And I think that's proper financing, which frankly, I'm a generation of leader who, who faced eight or nine crises where authorities were not, uh, you know, uh, quick enough at the time to, to, to invest and put money. The money now is there. We just need to invest it in the right technologies and cleaner technology. So we believe that the rebound has to be green. Um, and, and, and we see all of this, believe it or not, because the chemical industry has been always recognized part of the problem. And yes, we, we have been part of the problem in the CO2 emission, but we are part of the solution. There will be no green deal without chemistry. Chemistry is called the, uh, the, the, the mother of all industries. And huh? virtually whatever is around you uh, and connectivity is enabled by chemistry. And there will, no, there will be no circularity without chemistry. So it's very important that we have that framework. And I think Yvonne as well and the team talked about the partnerships. We cannot do it alone. You need public-private partnerships with academia, with NGOs. And that private and public partnership has to build that coherent framework for innovation and investments for clean and circular growth. So on us quickly, Solar Bay One Plan is there are 10 ambitious uh, commitments around three pillars. Uh, we are very proud that Solvi with our Solvi One Planet commitments because it's holistic. Uh, first pillar climate, the second one is resources, and the third one is better life. I'm going to just give you a taste of it um, for sake of time. Climate, obviously, lowering green, uh, greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, uh, aligned with the Paris Agreement. We eliminate the use of coal. We say this reduce our pressure on biodiversity. We, we pledged it even before uh, uh, coronavirus came, uh, the global sanitary, sanitary crisis, you know. The second pillar, resources, it's about uh, saving natural resources for future generations, so increasing water use efficiency, uh, doubling, more than doubling our circular economy. Today, 7%, we want to bring into 15% minimum in 2030, increasing the waste recovery. Yeah? There, there is a waste virtually everywhere. Can we reuse the waste? And the last one, the better life, is the alignment with the people, not only on, on the safety side, which is very important for uh, you know, any industry, but also embed the inclusion and diversity, which is very close to my heart. Um, and we, we, we extended maternity leave and actually to parental leave now to 16 weeks globally, wherever you are to support more the, the diversity in our ranks. Um, so it takes time, it takes investment, it takes uh, a strong conviction from top to down. Uh, for example, to give you just a small example, we are the largest solar farm investors in the US <laughs> in our industry. Why? Because we need solar energy, uh, you know, to produce uh, those type of things, right? So, so that's it. You know, we realize that it's not only about getting a raw material to end life and making a product and selling it, it's about the whole ecosystem, including the type of energy we have and recycling the end product and giving it another life. We have now an alliance with Veolia to recycle batteries because the battery at its end of life is not a waste actually. It's full of natural resources, metal, precious metal. If you can do a good job and recycle all of this, you are building a circular economy. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for, your, for your answer. I hear a lot of ambition at AB InBev at, uh, at Solvay. Uh, I also hear it takes time. Um, Mr. Yuanu, are companies doing enough? Do they have enough time or do they have to accelerate? 
Uh, that is a big, big, big important question because uh, uh, as, as, as we have heard on this panel, this is a major transition. And in fact, I, I would argue that this is a major disruption and a lot of companies are having trouble with it. Why? Because if you consider the environmental and social issues and challenges that the world is facing, these are domains that typically companies haven't profoundly engaged with. And therefore they find themselves now in a situation where they lack the skills, the experience and, and the knowledge that they need in order to deal with those domains. And that's almost natural, right? For the last 50 years, we have paid so much attention to a narrowly defined and very short-sighted economic context without really understanding, as we should, the, the broader impact of business. So companies are having this disruption moment right now. And as always, um, it's a choice about whether to adapt or whether to be replaced. And we know that, you know, the corporate graveyard is packed with once iconic brands because they failed to make these transitions. Now, within that, uh, within that kind of uh, framework of change, it's, it's important to understand that, um, you know, these are not the, the incremental uh, changes that we have seen in the past. Think about the automobile industry, for instance. Well, we go from fossil fuel cars to electric cars and then discussing the future of mobility. Dif entirely different sets of capabilities needed for each, each of those transitions. Will big companies be able to acquire or build that capability? I think the story of sustainability is still playing out. Look, about, uh, uh, look at the global food supply chain, going from traditional meat to lab-grown meat or to vegetable-based uh, uh, diet. Those, again, radically different transitions and radically different underlying sets of capabilities and resources. And there's a big question mark about the transition. What, I'm, what I would uh, finish off is that um, we need that transition to happen. We are running out of time. Yes, Tesla has huge market valuations, but how many Teslas are on the streets? It's more traditional cars that are on the streets. Can we wait for Tesla to, to have the volume that traditional automobile companies have? No, by that time, we'll be long run out of our carbon budget. So we need to start talking about institutional changes that allow the transition of huge companies like the ones that are represented on this panel today um, through regulation, through institution building, and EU is quite ahead in that, in that race, to enable this transition for the entire planet together. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in that sort of institution building coordination uh, in order to get us there. All right. Thank you. Yvonne, um... Uh, we heard that the, the discussions in the EU were really tough and, and, and so it's great that uh, you could announce the news that you just announced. Uh, when we were uh, talking with Frans Timmermans in the interview, which we will, uh, the full interview with which we'll publish later on, he said um, that uh, for, for businesses he would make two promises. One is uh, he would in the EU will involve uh, businesses along the way. Um, and, 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 and the EU would measure the impact of uh, every decision they make and that uh, um, the, the EU would not change uh, uh, opinion along the way. Um, and so that was, that was a, a, a very uh, a, a important uh, remark that he made. Uh, could, you, could you talk a bit a little bit about that, about how you are going to involve businesses in in the decision making process and in the in 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 what's happening now between now and, and 2030 yes thank you i mean um let me say that i think we have always tried to do that <laughs> to involve business and that is indeed where um, we are in a bit of a different uh, context right now at least as far as i can see i've been working in this area for a long long time um and there was always still a lot of questioning around, you know, is it really feasible? Should we really do this? Will it not hamper prosperity and, uh, you know, uh, um, also the, the well-being, not just of the people, but also of the companies? So uh, we will definitely uh, build on this. We will talk to each sector and, and work with them, uh, depending on which set of regulations is most important for them. I think we have already seen and... Uh, Again, the chemical sector is, is uh, one case in point where I think they have moved already in the past years looking forward, you know, how can we tackle this challenge? And, and they have come forward with a roadmap on how to become uh, climate neutral. And those are the kind of um, initiatives that we can then use to, to sit together and to see, okay, what are also the rules at EU level that are 
maybe uh, putting some barriers? Where do we need to have additional rules? Where do we need to change things? And, and that is exactly uh, what we hope to do. So we have the usual, I would say, uh, stakeholder consultations, which is very broad, which also uh, addresses everybody, uh, so to say, who would like to uh, comment. But we also have many more targeted discussions to really go deep and to try and, and link up, you know, the whole, um, how shall I say, the, the, the whole spectrum of instruments that are there. And this goes again from uh, regulation, but it is also about funding, you know, support for financing, support for innovation, how we can now at least use the, the dire situation we're in with the uh, COVID pandemic to indeed make sure that the money that will be available and that will be made available. And also on that, there has been agreements uh, yesterday evening late by, by heads of state and government that this money is also used to support the, uh, the different sectors that need to make major investments. And I think there is now alignment of the, let's say the governments and the authorities and the, the uh, economic actors to really go there and to see how we make use of all these instruments. So we look forward to that. Also with the people, because again, I think somebody mentioned it before. I mean, by now it is also the employees, ah, it was in your documentary, uh, who, who are very keen uh, for the companies to engage in this transition. And of course, also the consumers. And I think what Mr. Ioana was saying, I mean, there will be changes in demand for the products. So I think we're well advised, all of us, to, to engage in this, uh, in this discussion and see how we best prepare and accelerate, because uh, it is the decade of action now that we really need to accelerate. We have had enough discussions on you know, whether it's needed or not, but uh, now let's, let's start making it happen. And I'm very encouraged, huh, I have to say, there is so much more interest and support so uh, it's it's a positive outlook that we have ahead of us. Okay, thanks uh, thanks a lot. Um, I hear a lot of uh, things. Uh, I heard in, in the documentary, regulation is coming. Uh, you said demand is is uh, changing. Um, we have to accelerate if you want to really target tackle the the climate uh, problems. Um, maybe a question for uh, Ms. Barcenas and Ms. Ms. Kadri. Maybe uh, Ms. Barcenas first. Do you agree that you have to accelerate? And if so, how can it be? Uh, how can it be done? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I absolutely share the sentiment. And you know, now is the time. Um, you know, and and change takes time, right? So we need we need to start, and we need to start fast, and we need to accelerate. I think you know the biggest challenge ahead of us is to make sure that that transition happens at scale and at pace. And we cannot lose the momentum coming out of the pandemic. And, and, you know, to reach that scale, we need to champion, as we mentioned, new and disruptive technologies. We need to identify innovative financing mechanisms. We need the enabling policies, regulatory backbones that Europe is putting in place right now. And they are leading on many fronts around the world. As I mentioned, we operate across 50 markets and we're, we're um, watching Europe uh, very keenly to see uh, what are those regulations that are going to allow us to make that transition a lot quicker at scale, and then maybe we can start bringing some of that that fresh thinking, the, the new perspective, uh, into to other markets as well. And you know, in an effort to help create, help, help operationalize that that competitive marketplace for uh, for the transition. And you know, Professor Yannou mentioned um, capacity and and capabilities building. I, I definitely agree. I think this is the biggest opportunity if you look at a company like AB InBev, where we truly believe that shared beliefs can turn into scalable ambitions. Um, so how can we create those shared beliefs across our entire supply chain is our biggest opportunity. Um, and, and to do this, we, we created two programs and I'll briefly talk about them. One of them is our 100 plus sustainability accelerator program where we identify uh, startups tap into the startup world and, and, and the innovative thinking uh, that is coming out from everywhere around the world, not just in the Western world, everywhere in every market, uh, we are seeing uh, startups come out and, and, and innovators uh, come out and, and identify solutions for our shared challenges. Uh, so these are the types of solutions that we pilot around the world and, and we try to scale them up. On the other hand, we also engage with our largest suppliers. If you think about it, uh, we are, uh, if not the largest, one of the largest uh, you know, can purchasers, bottle purchasers of the world. We are uh, the largest malt purchaser of, of, of the world. So how do we engage with our supply chain? How do we influence into our supply chain is another big question. And, you know, for this, we have developed our Eclipse platform. This is a, a sustainability dedicated collaboration platform where to date we have over 50 of our uh, major suppliers signed up 
that are uh, working with us to share that ambition, but also to facilitate shared goals, target setting, identify new ways of measurement, um, you know, communicate around the, the SDGs and the climate actions that are needed around the world, but also for the first time, find out new and more innovative ways to co-innovate, to co-design into the future. And I think this is where the real opportunity is. Um, so, you know, we've been on this journey for, for decades now. Uh, I think we've really seen that acceleration over the last few years, especially with, with the pandemic this year. And, you know, there were a lot of naysayers. There, there were a lot of people early earlier on the year and back in March or April that would come to companies or NGOs or the media or the government to say, are the SDGs going to be put on the back burner? Are you taking a pause? What does this mean for sustainability? Is the world, you know, uh, the world as we know it is changing. What does this mean? And fast forward to November, December, sustainability, sustainable development, a green recovery has taken on such a new meaning and significance that was so unprecedented six to eight months ago. And I think we have great momentum coming out of the, uh, this, this pandemic. And, and you know, us as, as uh, leading companies of the world, we are doing our, our, our part in, in trying to be part of the solution. I got a question about uh, your role uh, and, and, and your role on, on SMEs as well, but that's for, uh, for later. Uh, Ms. Kadri, uh, do you agree? What's your opinion? Do we have to accelerate? Well, I think uh, in my mind, acceleration is probably a soft word. We need to turbocharge, if I may say it this way, right? Um, I think a uh, sense of urgency is here. Um, we had uh, an ultimate wake-up call with this, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, unique uh, crisis in a lifetime, we hope so, right? An associated sanitary crisis around the world. Who could believe that 2020 would be as it is today, right? I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. So it has been a stress test for all of us. No company will have a future if it doesn't raise the bar of ESG. I, I really believe it. Uh, so it needs to have a strategy on, and a roadmap embedded in the strategies of the company. Um, and, and, and given the current concept, uh, co context, specifically in Europe, an accelerated green, green rebound will only happen if it considers economy, health, environment are symbiotic with huge financial support, which we talked about. So um, in my mind, how it can work, again, the EU, as an example, should accelerate the support to innovation. It's happening. I mean, like the uh, Alliance of Batteries, uh, the Professor Yanis talked about that. We are in the battery. Uh, technologies, right, in EV and hybrid. And the obstacle we are all facing is the lack of infrastructure to roll them out on a broader scale. Uh, to illustrate this, the sales of electrically charged, chargeable cars in the EU increased by 110% over the past three years, whereas the number of charging points grew only by 58%. So the, the infrastructure is falling below what is needed already. And we need, we need to turbocharge, double down on those in, investments to allow us actually and Professor Yanis, again, you say that I prefer to cannibalize myself than someone else is doing it for me. Actually, my potential growth opportunity in an EV or hybrid car is actually double than in, in, uh, in an internal convention engine car because I make the car lighter, therefore consuming less fuel, therefore uh, releasing less CO2, right? So better for the planet. So I think that's important on the infrastructure. The second point, the EU plays an essential role in building the adequate infrastructure regulation around all of this, be it circularity, etc. And we need that, uh, along with um, social adaptation, uh, new skills. We, we need digital, we, we need unlearning and relearning. We need digital skills in our organization, specifically in the chemical industry, right, which is really a lag in digitalization. We are moving with solving in industry 4.0 in our in our plants manufacturing, and we need more skills. And the third point, uh, which was not discussed, is we need the EU to defend the global level playing field and a fair trade policy. And this is so important for all companies, small, medium, large enterprises. Uh, as for example, the the chemical industry is highly competitive, um, and and clean technologies must remain competitive, especially during the scale up phase but not only, and we need to avoid innovation leakage. And that's important, that's things we, we are sharing with, uh, with Yvonne, with the EU, with Timmermans and others, because it's so critical to make this green deal, uh, not only an icon, but start to become a beacon. As you know, China has pledged neutrality by 2060, you have Japan, you have you know, other 
uh, and, and the new administration in the US. So you, you've seen others following Europe and people will look up at Europe to see if they are really building a sustainable, profitable uh, and last long in model around those new innovations towards more carbon neutrality. All right, thank you very much. It's uh, one o'clock. That means that uh, and we know that two of you have a meeting at one, uh, at one o'clock, so we need to round it up. So uh, to all the panelists, thank you so much for being here, for taking the time uh, to answer our questions. We're really sorry that Gillian uh, wasn't there. It's really early in New York, so probably it's, it's that, I don't know. Um, so, uh, and thank you uh, everyone for joining. I hope uh, you enjoyed what you saw. I hope you enjoyed uh, the, the, the panel. Um, this is the decade, we are the generation. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank you.